Hi, everyone. Well, first of all, I'm just going to mention that this might be sounding a little different. The audio quality might be a little bit different. This is an away game. <laughs> I'm not at home in my sad little room in front of my microphone. We're doing a little away game here, and I'm also going to be appearing on their podcast, so we'll tell you all about it. But let's start off. So please introduce yourselves. Give a little rundown on what you do and why you're qualified to speak on Boston culture and on this topic, moving in Boston in particular. Sure. My name is Marion. I'm uh, one of the founders of uh, Premium Q Moving and Storage. So, quick little story. I moved to Boston from Eastern Europe, Romania in 2012. Had a moving job for about two years. Saved up some money. Uh, worked seven days a week to be able to do that. And then bought a truck, decided that all right, I had enough experience even with my prior background in the furniture assembly uh, industry and then uh, started Premium Q and then a friend of mine joined and uh, all of a sudden now it's what 2014 2015 and we're in the ninth year of business and uh, started in Medford Mass we have a second location now in Tampa and it was a fun journey Absolutely, guys. Hello, my name is Victor Shaves. Uh, I'm the sales manager at Premium Q Moving. So I came on with Marion and Sergio about a few years after they started Premium Q. I've been the sales manager ever since. So dealing with nonstop people moving in Boston, I think we're definitely qualified <laughs> to speak a little bit on that. And as I mentioned, you also have a podcast. So can you just mention that? So initially the podcast was called Moving Tips, but we recently rebranded. It's called um, Life Beyond Boxes with Premium Q. And it can be found obviously on all platforms. Wonderful. Starting with YouTube, Apple, Spotify, whole nine yards. And I came on and I talked all about my move to Boston to talk about myself, something I don't do a lot on my own <laughs> podcast. So hopefully everyone will check that out and I will be sure to share lots of links, etc. So... Since I came here, people talk a lot about how moving is particularly bad here. I've just made a joke about, oh, people moving in Boston. Do you actually think it's worse here? So I think moving is bad no matter where you live. I think what makes it a lot worse in Boston is the way that Boston is set up. So anybody, I'm sure everyone that's listening to this podcast has been a car in, box, in Boston with all the streets, the one ways, the narrow drives, the thorough drives. So you add that but with a box truck and it just makes everything more complicated. There's streets that we can't go on. There's streets that we have to take a 20 minute, you know, wrap around on other low streets bridges. to get to low bridges, the whole nine yards. So it's the location of Boston and all the suburbs that make moving a little bit more stressful. What do you think? It's a challenge if you're not from here, because you're just not familiar with that kind of layout. And it's just, it, it's really like the, the entire layout, even so, a lot of suburbs, go to Belmont from Cambridge, it's impossible to not encounter one low bridge that you're not able to use a box truck to get under. So when that happens, then you have to reroute and you know, God forbid you do that between two, after 2 p.m. <laughs> I know, rush hour here starts really early. I just it's drove over here at three and it was a nightmare. It gets earlier and earlier by the year, <laughs> it's nuts. So it's a challenge if you're not used to the, to the city of Boston and surroundings especially with a box truck. So you did not mention the thing that I always think of, which is that everyone here moves on the same day. <laughs> Pretty much. It's a lot of them. I don't August know if you've worked anywhere else first. in the U.S. This is not normal. Of course, there's a busy season. I actually have one of my dearest friends in Philadelphia runs. She manages a real estate company. And she's like, yeah, there's a busier season, but it is not like that September 1st, Super Bowl, doomsday thing. I was always wondering if this applies in other cities. And every time when we go to conferences and whatnot, uh, I remember that was the first thing that I asked. Um, and now with the second location in Tampa, we wanted to see, like, does this apply over there? And it doesn't. But I feel like the combination of cool starting in a date and then all, a lot of the leases getting renewed. But then the biggest problem is not just that, is the fact that it's the influx of people that make the traffic worst. And a lot of the students moving, they rent their own trucks. And then parents coming with them, kind of adding up to that situation. And because of that, now it's true. Like, why like, are these not starting on September 1st in Tampa or New York? Like, why the hell? <laughs> it had to be, and we, we've obviously dove into this a lot and have talked about this a lot, but it's... Because it's not even exclusive to like cities. Like when you know we were doing this, um, I always thought that okay, it's just a city thing. So I was talking to uh, New York movers, and they were like, "Yeah, I mean, we're big end of month, like we're not really any special." 
So we kind of do, like dove in thinking about what's so crazy in Boston. And for whatever reason, it just has to be the combination of all the college kids moving in. And then for somewhat down the line, all these landlords must have said, okay, like well, it makes <laughs> sense to just make all the leases end that day because now there's more people that are moving in the same day. You know, it's also men, right? So they have more people that are willing to sign leases. So they could probably charge a little bit more. And then you get into Boston being crazy prices like it always is. And there's no flexibility on the 31st and the 1st. So if you have a landlord and you're trying to turn over the apartment to the new people, if it was June, you know, 30th or you know, July 1st, you might, yeah, you know what? The other tenant's not going to move in until a couple of days after. So, yeah, you can take your time. You can do it all in one day, August 31st and September 1st. Impossible. I don't care how nice your landlord is. <laughs> he is not letting you or she's not letting you move in and out on the same day. So then it gets hectic. Now your one-day move isn't actually a two-day move, and we keep your stuff overnight and then deliver it the next day. I was going to say, what are the? Uh, I always wonder the actual logistics of this. If it's all September 1st, you know, you got to get out, and then in theory they're going to at least give it a nice broom sweep to the yeah. apartment, maybe patch some holes. Like, yeah. how does this actually work? And where do people sleep? Do they get a hotel? Do Airbnb, they stay with friends? Yeah. Airbnb? Yeah. In the truck? A lot of hotels. <laughs> a lot of, you know, if you have a friend that's not kind of, you know, ending at that time. A lot of them are, then obviously, the college students, so a lot a lot of them stay, you know, at the hotel with their parents or like that. But yeah, it's all, they need up, you know, poles. Not a lot of going to repaint the whole apartment, you know, in a couple hours. Um, but it's kind of cleaning it up to turn around new people that move in. Um, and then God forbid, you know, yeah, there's and moles. And, and from a logistical standpoint, um, most of the job, I would say jobs on yeah. August 31st have an overnight hold. It's what it's called. They keep the stuff in the truck uh, and then gets delivered next day. So that's why people can actually go and stay at an Airbnb. And by the way, Airbnb, like check prices on Airbnb <laughs> on August 1st, Everything I mean, uh, August 31st, September 1st in hotels. All like the industry affects everything. I mean, I have an idea for a moneymaker, which is you all night rave, but it's like a slumber party rave and people can bring sleeping bags <laughs> and they can all just crash in a warehouse together. And it's like 10 bucks to get there in. Go. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> it's just so the food. Just, they can sleep yeah, yeah, exactly. They don't mind. <laughs> They'll be fine. <laughs> it's just the warehouses are completely against having people. <laughs> oh, of course, of course, of course. I mean, you know, I haven't gone too far this month yet. I think there might be some insurance issues. <laughs> a little like, bit of liability. Yeah, a little bit of liability. We'll figure yeah. it out you do to prepare for September 1st? Is it, I mean, you only have a certain number of trucks, a certain number of guys. What, is it a different type of day? It is. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, in terms of preparation, like from a vehicle standpoint, uh, we rocks. The entire summer season is like that because the, just the numbers don't make sense to buy or try to lease a three-year truck just because between, uh, I don't know if you knew, but May 1st is the official day of moving season in mm -hmm. Boston. And then uh, it kind of fades out after September 2nd and 3rd. But between and during those um, months, we add additional trucks to our fleet. Sometimes we have three month, uh, six month, and sometimes even just month to month, uh, week by week, or daily, depending on. You know, but we do have to rent if we want additional trucks strictly just August 31st and September 1st because mm -hmm. of the overnight hold situation because a lot of the jobs that you know we get on august 31st are not able to be delivered on the morning of september 1st they're delivered in the afternoon so a lot of the things have to be logistical kind of like all right this truck has all the jobs that are only being delivered in the afternoon so then the morning the morning is also booked up so then that has to be a, a an empty truck to to be used so we rent like from a logistical standpoint we rent a lot of uh Pansky rider budget enterprise um, but even that you must have to do well in advance and be on top of, correct? Because yeah. you're the only ones. And we have a good relationship with uh, one of the rental truck companies and uh, they know and they always expect. But yeah, we place the order <laughs> way in advance for that. It's still crazy, right? Like, do you have, like, you're in the office, people calling you, they're screaming, yelling, where is my stuff? <laughs> yeah, like, someone's in traffic you were talking about. There's yeah. a lot of things that are completely out of your control, no matter how efficient and wonderful you are as a moving company. To be honest with you, it's a ton of jobs that day, more jobs than we do in a two day span, you know, obviously throughout the year, but they're smaller jobs. And a lot of them are just loading the truck or offloading the truck. So it definitely does get a little crazy. It gets a little have a great job of preparing people. And most people know that has been living in Boston. I mean, a lot of people are moving for the first time around that time. So they don't know what to expect, but I would say 
75 to 80 percent of them are not only our returning clients that probably move you know around that same time but have moved around there so everyone gets how crazy it is and then you'll get people call and say hey listen i, I just want to make sure you guys are going to get to us and i go <laughs> we're going to get to you we don't know when it's going to be but it's going to be sometime in the afternoon but it really it it's goes pretty smoothly i mean and now and then, you know knock on wood now we're going to horrible 31st <laughs> and first but it goes pretty it's you know these crews are usually two to three man crews depending on it and we'll run 13 14 them and they'll have three jobs a day but they're they typically go a lot quicker i think the last two years in a row we've had all the guys done by six seven o'clock so you know we've had random days where the guys are still offloading at like midnight so it's crazy it's a lot of jobs but i think the way that we organize everything and I think we're so prepared for it to be lack of a better term a, a shit show that it goes pretty smoothly you know every year but then there's also the weather like there's so many things i mean it could be 100 a degrees variables. it could be these horrible thunderstorms yeah. where you know torrential downpour like it's just wild Nothing can be worse than one of those winter storms that we get on calls. Thank, like, God, we don't have to, oh, yeah. Thank not, God we don't have to worry about like that in those days. There's nothing worse than that. So, Wait, so what happens in the winter if there's a horrible storm? People call and cancel? Are they like, you're still coming? Like, what's... A little, little, <laughs> little more worried that we're not coming. But <laughs> a lot of times, I don't want to... I don't want to, like, downplay the entire snowstorm situation because lately, we actually yeah. been pretty good. But we did have situation. Um, there's nobody on the road. Just the truck. <laughs> truck the, the guys are used to this kind of weather. So, of course, if it's one of those situations where the uh, traffic is completely blocked uh, by authorities and whatnot, then, of course, we're not doing it. But a lot of times, it's not as bad as people think because you come in with a, you know, 26-foot yeah. truck. In the winter, it's actually not a, not a bad uh, kind of thing. To so, but going back to the September 1st situation is, yes, there are a lot of factors but we also learned to set the right expectations. The biggest problem that, and we were causing a lot of the issues to ourselves. In the beginning, yeah. Because we were giving a small of a window of arrival, uh, especially in the afternoon. So the window less, we learned, I think it was 2019, that we had the biggest yep. uh, problems because of that. We kind of caused the problems with the expectations that we set. Because we were saying like, all right, we got to get there seven. And God forbid you get there by 8.30, now that you know the client is is pissed. Yeah, yeah it's uh, starting out bad. Now. No, now it's either even the mornings have arrival because you never know. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's just like we we learn to set the right expectations. Uh, arrival time is a much wider window now. So after twelve, uh, I mean, uh, uh, if you, if we're not able to get between the twelve to five, the next one is we'll get there. You're like we guarantee that we'll do your job. It's just we'll let you know one to two hours ahead once one of the crews is done. And I think the biggest thing is on that day, just staying in contact with all clients. So, you know, we obviously yeah, have a lot of clients that call thing. us, but before they even get the thing about the, okay, what time are they gonna arrive? We're usually having our customer service department call them, update them on the time, say, hey, listen, this is how the morning job is going. We're gonna be there about this time, you know, down that wide window, and then they get a call when their crew is leaving, headed out to them. So a, a lot of it is just staying in touch with customers, updating them on the day. And sometimes that is calling customer and say, listen, the morning job is, you know, going crazy. So we're gonna be there later, but that way they're not calling us saying, hey, where's the crew? And then we're saying, hey, we're gonna be there in four hours. It's us saying, hey, bear with us. We're gonna get you taken care of. Don't worry about it at all. It's just, this is happening in the morning job. So we're gonna be there a little later than expected. Um, and again, setting the expectation, everyone is fine. Again, everyone just needs to move out on that day. Yeah. Um, but I don't care when it happens. They just need to have it done. We had a situation, I feel like it was a very short move. It's like less than a mile. And we the movers were so nice, but they had had their morning job was like a nightmare. And yeah. they called us. They kept telling us, you know, that we thought this was going to take three hours. It's a nightmare. And, you know, we were frustrated. We were mad at them because yeah. they were communicating with again. us. So if I had to September 1st, what time should I book a mover? When should I book a mover? Yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> 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 You're already like almost full up. Like. Almost, almost. Yeah. You get there. I mean, it, it feels, so the bigger and bigger we get as a company, the more returners we have, especially for those days. Um, so going into any given year, we probably have four or five trucks that are already booked up just from our returning clients. Um, and they call us fairly early. So like, we're um, talking four months. <laughs> yeah, they'll call us, you know, February, March. Um, a lot of them will just after we do the move in one year, just say, hey, down for the same spot next year, because I know I'm going to have like, I'm breaking up with her. Yeah, I haven't yeah. told her yet, but I will definitely be moving this time next year. <laughs> like mark it up. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, 
never too late to call because we run a lot of crews never and obviously late. we do a ton job. So if you feel like you are moving in that day and you feel like you're late to the game, play not. Give companies a call. There'll be companies that run out of availability, um, but we'll always try to squeeze you in. The good thing about the 31st and the 1st is it is a lot of small jobs, so we can get a ton done in one day. Um, so if you haven't yet, call Premium Q and book them. But if you still uh, are kind of looking for them, just give the move us, a moving company, a call. Um, get the quote for their start processes. Even if you have to change things when it gets to the date, always easier to have you in the system for those dates and then make adjustments rather than getting the schedule late. Right, because a lot of these are apartments, a lot of these are young people, students. It's not like you're moving a Steinway piano. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's probably a lot of IKEA furniture. Yeah, no four bedroom moves <laughs> on the thirty first and the first, not with the eight. They always tend to go, you should call your real estate agent, tell them to move the closing date. <laughs> yeah, so when should people move? When's the best time to move? I mean, I remember looking when we moved and you find literally calendars that are marked, you know, red, yellow, green mm -hmm. pricing wise. Yeah. Yeah. I mean ideally it's winter time. Yeah. 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 Off season. Off season. <laughs> so again, May first moving seat like official moving seat. Like, of course, if you moved in the summertime, like can just tell someone, well, guess what? Move into what yeah, possible, yeah. right? So ideally, you want to go towards the middle month, um, as close to the middle of the month as possible, and ideally not towards the weekend. So if you can... I was wondering if people want to move on the weekends. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you think about it, you know, people want to... I work from... Then. I know, I work from home. It's yeah. so funny. Yeah. We've always had that advantage of moving in, moving in the middle of the week. Because it's... I take a day off from work. I have to um, kind of either... Not get paid or whatever. Yeah. Um, but ideally, not during the weekends. So try to avoid as uh, much as you can. Avoid uh, Friday to avoid end of the month, beginning of the month, especially the last three beginning uh, and first three. So you know, twenty seventh to the third. Yeah. As much as you can. So if you show up to an apartment, what's the worst thing? Say. Uh, well, the worst thing is because we have a call the day before. Mm -hmm. So dispatcher calls the day before to make sure the one component that. Uh, affects the price of the move the most is packing. Now, in this case would be saying that you're packed, but then you get there and it's completely unpacked. And the, the problem, like one of the biggest problems is somebody's perception of what packing means. <laughs> it's a completely <laughs> different thing of what us as a need to do. One, from an insurance standpoint and two, from a liability standpoint, because yeah, we can have you signed, all right, release the liability from us and we you know we can just throw everything in a, in a plastic tote right i'm kidding but um biggest i mean the worst to see is getting and again if we're talking about a one-bedroom apartment it's not like the wall because how much you know how big the kitchen can be in a one-bedroom apartment but a regular you know a two-bedroom house we call the day before and then we're being told over the phone they're all packed it's all ready to go and then you get there and you realize like we actually need this full day here just for packing and that impacts a lot of things that people might not be in consideration. Like if you have a closing date, you might need to be out by five and typically that's not happening. <laughs> so now you might force to pay or you might need to like really, you know, do something like, you know, grab another truck. Yeah. Grab, sometimes we don't have extra paper available, right? Something might, might, not, might not have enough in order to are available at that moment to send them. So that would be the worst thing um, to happen. Another thing that can be is saying that your piano is on the first floor, it's actually <laughs> on the third floor stairs. Uh, and believe it or not, that happened a lot. <laughs> All the uh, time. Always some large piece of furniture <laughs> that they go, I go, you know, how large is it? And, you know, how much away? Oh, yeah, me and my grandmother moved in, in here. <laughs> and get there, and it's a straight piano that weighs 800 pounds. It's like, well, how strong is your grandmother? So it's sometimes people just think that, you know, I don't know if they're trying to tell us, if they're trying to convince themselves that it's not that it's heavy and now. it's that much stuff. But it's just be upfront with the moving company. There's ways that we schedule and we quote jobs that make it go more efficiently and as efficiently as possible so it actually cuts down on the cost so if you do need a little bit of packing we'll probably send an extra guy yeah the hourly rates a little bit higher go so much quicker so the final cost at the end is actually a cheaper than you saying that it's not that much us sending the crew size that's not the right crew size for your job us not having a guy to be able to go there and kind of help them and then all of a sudden it's going longer than it needs to be so just be upfront as we can with your moving companies. But see, this is the problem. I have a lot of shame about how much stuff I have, and I don't even think I have a lot of stuff. I think in terms of Americans, I think I'm like lower middle, but mm -hmm. I still have a lot of shame about yeah. it. So I want to like, I want to feel like my job is easy. Yeah. I want to tell you my job is easy because I want that to true. 
And then I always do this thing. It's like whenever I go to the dentist, I and even if I have cavities, I'm always like, just tell me it's not the mouth you've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I t- I'm so secure to the movers. I'm like, but this isn't this is like this is a normal amount of stuff, right? This is normal. This is like we're a family of four. Like but you know this that, is normal. And I and I get that. But the the whole we, we just talked about briefly of this in our episode before. There's no like there's no feelings between the guys and the um, stuff that's uh, going to be moved. So problem becomes we're being told over the phone this is what's this is what we can expect you put that in the notes you arrive and now uh, this tool on, on two ends of the yeah. spectrum because now the the customer might think well this is you know this is not a, as it looks right but then the guys dispatch saying like why are you lying why? blame sales for they blame, <laughs> typically they blame sales because they think oh you just downplayed it again so we can do more. so it's it just creates this entire get you know, of uh, back and forth but at the end of the day uh, and I get I get the fact um, you might not, you might say oh I want to think that uh, my you know my not the worst or whatever we've seen no. the worst <laughs> things that you can they were I can count probably maybe less than five, but there were situations where we had to leave. Like we couldn't touch anything. Like we had, like there was like, impossible, not even with gloves and masks. Yeah, there's do. some bits of that. Like, trust me, we've seen the worst of the worst. Well, this is my theory, because hoarders <laughs> is my prob- stuffies, like, are yeah, yeah. bad. <laughs> my theory is, because hoarders is kind of the worst thing, and yeah. nothing wrong with hoarders or, you know, the hoarder community yeah. coming after me, but pe- when people say like, oh, I'm a little hoarder, I go, no, you're not. Like you would <laughs> it if you were. So with ones that don't say anything, and then we get there and everything. Cause they, you know, people just sometimes don't know that we need to pack these things to move them. It's kind of like, oh, a toothbrush needs to be packed. Well, we can't bring a single <laughs> toothbrush in the truck and then <laughs> wonder where's your toothbrush and we're gonna have to buy you a new one. So it's everything kind of has to be in a box so we can kind of account for it. So that's, I always, you know, we got about Boston culture. We got to talk about how next to what it's like here. Can you share, are there certain types? Like certain, you know, if you put like the most common types of people who are moving in Boston where they call you and you're like, I'm clocked. I know who this is. You know, is it like the young professional, the student? Are there any of those types? The very large person with very heavy furniture, very, very large, the very rich person <laughs> with very heavy furniture. Like what are some of the types that you encounter? Yeah, there there definitely, you want to go? Yeah, I'll go first just because I, from a marketing perspective, I have to design all yeah. the times the <laughs> campaigns in a way that targets the right type of people. Yeah. So I'll talk about just the ideal and then you'll take on, on the, the reality. Next. Yeah. <laughs> so first, or I, I guess I shouldn't say the first, but it, I, and it took us a while to understand like who's our ideal customer. Ideal customer, let's be honest, it's not uh, a apartment and nothing wrong with uh, a student, wrong with in, in a studio apartment is just the amount of preparation, logistical uh, things that are needed both in, in, in the system in the warehouse, getting the truck ready and whatnot, it's the same for a three hour job versus a 12 hour job. <laughs> you might need an extra five, 10 minutes to add more supplies, right? So because of that, we realized, okay, our ideal customer is uh, typically, and I even give her a name, it's Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> she's married, she's around um, 40 plus. Years. She lives in Winchester, which is just 15 minutes uh, from Medford. She's a homeowner, lives with her husband and the kids, in a three uh, bedroom, two bath uh, house, right? Now, in order for her to afford that uh, that kind of house in in, uh, in Winchester, she needs to work in some of industry to make at least a hundred k above. Because otherwise, you, you know, you're not buying a house in Winchester because <laughs> it's not it's not cheap. or anywhere in Boston. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's the customer that we have, and I would say sorry, just give it as an example. Of course, the reason that I mentioned Jennifer is. Typically, well, I guess 50-50 in terms of decision maker. Yeah. At least what we hear, I still strongly believe that at the end of the day, um, the wife will have the final decision. Like, actually, this is a question for you. Like, who did who did decide? Uh, I book the movers both times. Okay. There you go. But I would so. say, I mean, we have a very equitable thing. Like this one usually is one who takes the kids to the doctor. There are things that are always like, oh, no, 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 I'm no. just saying it is interesting how these things get divided um, in a relationship. But yeah, I, with the moving, did a lot of logistics. No, but literally, I own a moving company. And when the guys came, I literally said, I'm not going to be here. Well, one, because I don't want to create any kind of uh, <laughs> necessary stress. But two, my wife will tell you where you where all the things go, yeah. right? So with that being said, that would be the first type of people. So um, the John, the husband, 
<laughs> Jennifer's husband. <laughs> it's also this couple's so boring. I've never <laughs> invited them to a cocktail <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. party ever. <laughs> live in Winchester. <laughs> now they could live in Watertown, Newton, uh, Medford, Somerville, and whatnot. But that's the ideal type homeowner. With and, and the reason that I say ideal is we can impact the most. It's not because of a monetary standpoint. I mean, yeah, we're in business, obviously, but um, that. That's the type of person that we can impact the most because they a lot more than um, just knows. All right, I'm just gonna need a couple of friends to, you know, get the couch in my in U-Haul and that's it. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, we all all dumb point. But person that we can impact the most because they know, I'm not gonna spend a week to pack our stuff. I'd mm-hmm. rather hire somebody to do it for me because it's done in a day. It's done properly. We know we get to destination or if they need to go in storage or whatnot. Or if it's interstate, you know. So that's the first type. Um, and then you can... Yeah, I mean, I think in a sales aspect, because obviously, you know, two different people differently. Um, think of more of it, quantity of size. So obviously, like, the suburbs are kind of one type of selling. I would think where it affects the, like, difference in bond is a little bit where people are at just life-wise. So you have college kids that mom and dad didn't make them, you know, or didn't book the movers for them that are calling and don't really know how moving works. So you just kind of tell them a little bit more. You explain everything. You say, listen, these are the prices. This is what it goes. The mom and dads that are out of state that do call for their kids. And then you explain the same stuff, but you also explain that like, hey, listen, make sure that your kids are packed or we can pack them, but make sure that they're not where you're not thinking they're going to be packed, but then they're not going to be, and now the price is going to go up. Make sure the beer can sculpture has exactly. been dismantled. Yes. Yeah, 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 you exactly. know, all the empty... I remember in college, everyone's like always putting empty bottle of liquor along their mantle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and like what? the cardboard cutouts yeah. of the Bud Lights making yeah. their bag. Yeah. And they're like, can you take press? I go, it's cardboard. <laughs> um, and then there's young professionals that value their time-wise, so they usually take us up on the packing. And then there still is... You know, the 50 to 55 year old, uh, you know, single Revere in Malden ladies that when they first pick up the car complaining about how their landlord jumped their rent and that's why they have to move. And I've been here 30 years and that's, you know, different people. So it's all really about setting expectations and covering your bases on each different type of client up because you know what to expect from them. Like not complaint wise, but just like where the move would go in their city that you're covering all that provide the most value for your customers. Typically the bigger the place, the easier for us because we can do our job and typically we're left alone to kind of do, not left alone from a, like, no, obviously the homeowners are there, but left alone to do our job <laughs> type of thing, right? Instead of uh, trying to like really, really explain the guys like how to do certain things it's just because it's a t- from a timing standpoint yeah. the last 10 percent we the commercial we I, I mean we talk mainly about um residential clients but one of our biggest um clients is intercontinental the hotel i mean just this week on and last week when we've been seven Five, eight times time, yeah. yeah hundreds of rooms at a time uh, helping to business meetings and whatnot um, so that would be like a, I would be 90 percent uh, maybe 80 percent residential 20 percent commercial with right now Having this conversation, I'm really, really, talk all the time, life stages. You could just talk about like moving stages. The ways that I've moved have really changed throughout my life in a very predictable path from like driving with my mom in a U-Haul <laughs> to Nashville, Tennessee, to like paying, saying to friends, like, can you come help us move? We'll give you pizza to professional movers to then hiring people. Pack us was really next, you know, line to cross. And I don't know if it's just that my time becomes more valuable, which is not really true. I get more tired. I'm scared of hurting my back. Like <laughs> All these things it, it's it's funny to think about it's a combination of all. yeah yeah exactly i do have a bad back so is Austin a good place to be a mover or is it a bad place to be a mover yeah from a um from a business standpoint boston is one of the most competitive number one uh so with that of course yes it's a it's a great industry especially for it's it's, it's a season seasonality uh involved in this whole aspect but yes it's a real estate market it's really good actually, years um, slow all right so it's like r- prices are high but inventory is low that's bad for you guys we are directly yeah. impacted yeah. Uh, and that's why we actually started um kind of looking at a lot more commercial projects that before we might have said well we don't have the time and the power of the trucks but now we started to like kind of look at things differently um and yes, we are directly impacted by the real estate market. So when whole, when is that two years almost? Two years, yeah. That completely like shifted the market in such a way because now we were 
uh, well, before, the big companies were not necessarily competing after small pie of just renters. Uh, I know we said ideal customer, it's a, it's a whole Jennifer, order, yeah. But, <laughs> but the last two years... What a b- Last two years, Janet didn't want to sell her anymore. Of course, yeah. she's got 2.5% in her house forever. She's I, know. <laughs> I know, I'm friends with John and he told me that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a good place for business. Um, a lot of transient people. I mean, a lot of people moving in, moving out. Yeah. And, and that of Boston, it's Boston and New York for city-wise that people, when they're moving, use movers the most. It's more difficult street-wise and, you know, getting in and out. So people are less likely to rent their own truck and do it themselves um, in Boston and in, in New York. So it's those cities. All the other cities, LA, more people move themselves in L.A. than they do it's Boston. Also population topic, a lot of Fewer people. stairs. Yeah. yeah, that is definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, but if you think about it, Tampa has fewer stairs, too, and that doesn't really... No one moves in Tampa. <laughs> Too hot, yeah. honey. <laughs> People go to Tampa to retire, not yeah, to Yeah, yeah, not to move. <laughs> so here's the most important question of all. Has your company ever struck? Oh, God, no. <laughs> when we saw the when we saw the, the question, we laughed. Um, I remember when I first, so no, the answer is no. Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> make it be a better story. But you wish? <laughs> I mean, just for the podcast. Not for your business or, you know, but just you, for the podcast. You have no idea how much <laughs> it costs to damage a Storo. Because... Uh, it involves state police, it, uh, you know, it's a whole it's different thing. I know like, I've seen um, some competitors, and I, like I wish no one, uh, because... Well, idiots in their own U-Hauls, right? Like who don't know, because I'm sure... A good amount of them. You know but what? There's, yeah, a lot of, there's a lot of transporting it's a trucks lot of, that It's a lot of companies that too. come from out of state, mm-hmm. they were never in Boston, and literally if they use a GP, a regular GP like Google Maps, doesn't Google Maps doesn't know that you're driving a truck. Uh, so if you don't have, so think about yeah. this, you're a, let's say you're a, a New York mover, uh, you come to Boston to deliver somebody from New York the first time, maybe the guy has never got out of New York. Um, yes, we've, we've all said uh, no truck signs, but let's be honest, like there are a lot of no, no truck signs that, them, that yeah. you go, it's not, not through them, but you well. pay attention. But that store drive, it's one that you don't <laughs> you don't want to mess around with. We um, still do have nightmares around this time, just waking up in, just in case. And every time I see one on Instagram, if you first thing you do when you store, everyone takes a picture of it. Only in Boston. And everyone posts it on only in Boston. And I still have a heart attack every time I see like a white truck where we have rentals that are white. But never, never been us, thank God. We have a training portal that we give to our guys. Um, and when we hire them. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, <laughs> we cannot control how much they watch through those uh, trainings, but the one thing, like we would never just somebody on a truck as a driver without pointing out a couple couple different things, uh, and, and Strive is one of them. And we, actually, this is a funny story, and then I'm done. We had one guy actually, uh, one coming back because, the, so he took him, he was supposed to go to pick up in Cambridge and a pick up in Boston. And then he did pick up in Cambridge and he literally returned to the office. Uh, it was a, um, actually it was local, <laughs> but he said, Aaron, I don't like the GPS just keep bringing me to the store drive. And I kid you not, I did not get, he <laughs> drove, you know, 40 minutes round trip. And I said, totally cool. Let me point out the map exactly where to go. So, you know, sometimes you just have to put a, like a safe yeah. point A to go yeah. to, like in Cambridge, yeah. like for example, MIT. And then from MIT, you go and you cross the bridge and then it's, it's fine. So I know so I kind of. That was, you know, <laughs> close there. <laughs> got knock on wood. Now this is <laughs> okay, I close every episode by asking, do you have any Philadelphia questions for me? Do you love Shane Victorino as much as we love Shane Victorino for hitting that I grand l- slam? I love Shane Victorino. Flying Hawaiian. Uh, yeah, love Shane Victorino. I actually just recently, um, someone was, I literally today on Twitter saw a clip of Shane Victorino throwing out someone at the plate, which like Brad Lidge's perfect 2008 season of saves. That's Shane Victorino. Biggest, that grand slam, um, I believe, I think it was 2018, I think it was. I don't know, 2008. Um, it was like the single handling anytime like people say that they're not into baseball and think baseball is boring i always bring it to that game and that play from the like zero to 100 when someone hits a grand slam to win a playoff game in baseball is single handling one of the best moments and feelings in sports and that forever be in, in, in my mind that was amazing boston yeah. sports memory he's apparently in england right now with the phillies they're playing the is mets really? in london this weekend nice and one other quick shame victory i worked for the 2008 obama campaign mm-hmm. and it was when the phillies were in the world series and we did all 
all these buttons that were like these co-branded Obama Phillies buttons. And one of them said Victor in 08, which literally spells out Victorino 8. And that was his number. <laughs> so awesome. whoever came with that, I still have <laughs> it. It's, cool. I think it's like a collector's item now. That's but. awesome. You any, you any Philly questions? Would you trade places now? Would you leave Boston going back to Philly? I don't feel like I can say that on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I got to kill listeners. I love it here. I actually got a, a, like a feedback from a listener who said, I think you're too hard on Boston. He said, I, I'm tired of people coming here and kind of shitting on it, acting like they don't want to live here. And I was like, well, I really like my life here. Yes, I really like my life here. Also, Philly's my hometown, and so that's a very deep bond. It's different if I Asheville, and I'd be like, oh, well, I miss my old neighborhood. It's like, no, 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 I miss. There's like something that goes deeper there. So I don't, I'm very happy here. I'm not shitting on Boston. <laughs> One of my friends said to me in Boston that was a transplant. They obviously came from California, and they said, I don't know why Boston always gets a bad rap. He goes, Boston, more than any other city, you hear a car could break down on the side of the road, and a ton of people will stop and try to help you out. They'll make fun of you the whole time. And they'll, <laughs> help, they'll help you out. I actually, I heard that. That's a good one. <laughs> okay, well, wonderful. We're all good. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. This was great. This was uh, for our little home and home. Go Celtics. <laughs>